I'm going to call the meeting to, to, to order of our April the 16th, uh, 2013, the Board of Social Services. At this time, we'll have the invocation. Our dear Lord Father, we thank you for this day, dear God. We thank you for your blessings in our life. Dear God, we thank you that we can witness the, the world coming alive again at the bright colors of spring. Dear God, we can't have to remember those folks in Boston, the lives that were touched, the lives that were lost. Dear God, we pray for the safety of our country. Dear God, be with us in our meeting today that we will do everything that pleases you. This we ask in thy name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to kind of jump around the uh, agenda a few minutes until we get a new board member. Uh, at this time, we are going to have the financial report. Does that sound like what you want to do? That's fine. Good afternoon. What you have before you today is the uh, March financial report. We're three quarters of the way into our fiscal year. Most of our expenses are in line with uh, where we would be at this point in the year, with the exception of a few items that I'll make mention of. Uh, under the category uh, TANF assistance, that particular line item consists of our Work First EA as well as our adoption assistance. And our Work First EA, we have spent that pot of money for the year, so that's elevated the percentage there. Also, if you look at general assistance, right now that percentage stands at 90%. That particular group of accounts includes our LEAP and our SIP allocations, and both of those have been exhausted for the year. So that's the reason those percentages are elevated because those funds uh, are no longer going to be available. And if you look down at the bottom of the page, um, the balance left as of the end of March is 405000 And that leaves us a little bit um, over budget for this particular month. It's not that we're going to be over budget for the year, at least not so far. We had several revenues that did not come in in March. One of the biggest being the reimbursement from our state report, the 1571, which is under the line item state aid to DSS. That ranges every month from, depending on how many allocations we have left to pull down, between 130 to about $150,000. So next month you'll actually see two amounts that will flow through that line item, and that should um, give us a better picture for April. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Does anyone have any questions for Ms. Sherry? Okay. If not, we'll accept that as presented. Okay, thank you. And at this time, we're going to go jump back up to the top, and we're going to do the swearing in of our new board member, which is Dr. Carson Mosley. I want to recognize Ms. Paige Barnes from the Clerk of Court Office for the swearing in. Do you really? Do solemnly swear that I will support and maintain the Constitution and law of the United States of America and laws of North Carolina, not inconsistent therewith, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of my office as a board member of the Alexander County Department of Social Services. Okay. If you'll sign right here, please.
Dr. Mosler, we're glad to have you. I think you'll be like the rest of the board members. We're in all of the staff and how they take care of the needs of our county. And we're looking forward to getting to know you and using your talents to, to add something to our board. And I'm sure you will. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for agreeing to serve. <laughs> At this time, I'm going to relinquish <laughs> the... Uh, To this, uh, one thing I have done is the financial report because we're going to have to take action on it. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I apologize for being a little late today. Uh, so we are here for this. Mm -hmm. We'll take up the agenda. Okay. Um, at this time, um, everyone has a copy of the agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve today's agenda as written? I'll make a motion. Second. Second. Right. It's been moved and second that we uh, go as the agenda for today. Um, everyone has a copy of the minutes from March the 19th uh, meeting. Do you? Have, I have a motion to approve this minute. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. I'll second. It's been moved and second that we approve the minutes from March the 19th this meeting. Uh, at this time, we will have the um, introduction of our new staff members. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Trina Riddle and I supervise Family and Children's Medicaid and Daycare and Work First. I have three new employees. One is not actually new, Karen Brown. She has always been in my unit for three years now, but she has been promoted to Work First. She's gonna do um, what Lee Milstead was doing because she also was promoted. And I also have April Hartness and Davin Lackey. They are Alexander County natives and they have started in the Family and Children's Medicaid unit. They started on April the 1st. Um, we've been training and reading the manual, and they have come back every day. I've been so proud. <laughs> I was afraid I would scare them off, but I'm so glad to have them, um, and we look forward to working with them. Thank you. And, <laughs> <laughs> and welcome aboard this. Uh, we hope we didn't scare you either. <laughs> half me coming in late, but welcome aboard. Uh, I'd, I'd like to introduce... Um, Lee, if you don't mind standing up, I wanted to let you know Lee's been with us for some time now, but, but she has been promoted. Um, she is our child support lead agent. Um, you all know that Carol Church retired, and Lee was promoted in uh, Carol's place. We call her the child support supervisor, and she has all the duties of a supervisor, but technically under Office of State Personnel, um, her job title is lead agent. Um, I'm going to do everything I can about that, <laughs> but uh, we are very happy that Lee's been promoted, and, and she's kind of in transition trying to do both jobs, so we, we need to give her all the encouraging words that we can. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you. Lee, I know she's been doing a good job, so welcome to step up. <laughs> um, now we will hear uh, the uh, financial report with Cinch. I missed She did that. Okay. okay. Okay, um, here now. Uh -huh. Sorry. Uh, our program today will be uh, a presentation on child abuse. Uh, we missed the statistical, statistical report. I'm sorry. I got okay. you. I got it out. Okay. I got it out. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, the statistical, I always, I was hoping somebody did that because I never can say it. Statistical <laughs> report highlights what the supervisors. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Matt Reese. I'm the Food Nutrition Services and Adult Medicaid Supervisor. If I can draw your attention to page one of the statistical report, and as you all can see from October until February, we had not been presenting any data. Um, and as we have noted on here, the information beginning with March, that is from NCFAST. NCFAST is a new computer system 
called North Carolina Families Accessing Services Through Technology. It's basically a new way that the state has created a system for DSS to become automated. And previously, our reports and information came out of the old system. And the state has implemented this new computer system in waves. And because of them implementing it in waves, part of our reports was in the old system and part of our new reports were in the new system. So we felt it appropriate to wait and report out once we had been in NC Fast at 100% activity and involvement in it, and plus to give the system some time to work out some kinks with the reports. Because we went live in January towards the end of the month. February would have been our first full month in it, so we have presented data here today. And as you can tell, the information that we're reporting out is somewhat different. In the past, we would report out total households, total individuals, number of new applications, number of reapplications, total value of the food stamps, and the value per household. Due to the change with the reports in NCFAST, the information that we're going to be reporting out will be total cases, total participants, number of applications, and total benefits. Basically, you will see total cases is going to equal out to the total households, but it's how it's presented in the supervisor's dashboard within the computer system. Total participants is gonna be the equivalent to total um, individuals. Number of applications. In the old system, it would track the number of reapplications and the number of new applications. In NCFAST, it does not segregate that. It presents it out in one number, one data. And so we'll track the number of applications. It also gives us the total benefits issued. So I can present to you today that in the month of March, Alexander County, we had 2,817 cases. We had 6,574 participants. And in the month of March, we took 141 applications with total benefits being $730,933. At this time, that's the only information that I was going to really present does anyone have any questions, anything of that nature? Before we reported out, Cindy and myself, as we've reported out to you guys before, we've really delved into this, trying to get as much information to make sure that the data that we present is as accurate as possible. And I have actually spoken with um, a young lady with, um, with the state that works in the reports division and she was explaining a lot of the different processes to me to where Cindy and myself both felt comfortable in presenting this data you know, here to you today. I guess the only thing I noticed is just the number of people that we serve. That's basically one in six, one out of every six people in Alexander County use this service. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I do in speaking on reports, <clears throat> There is a way that I can go in now and can view the breakdown by age, ethnic origin. You know, it gives a lot of other different, you know, detail. But in comparison to how our agency has reported out in the past, we felt this was the best, you know, compromise. But as, of course, as always, if there's other information or data that you all would like, I would definitely be, you know, inclined to investigate and report out differently, you know, we can, you know, can change this around as the board and along with CNBC's fit, you know, if, if necessary. All right, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. If you will look on page one, at the Medicaid family and children's number of applications, you notice this month we had a huge increase. We went from 161 to 265, and I wanted to let you know that that is due to us trying to align our cert periods in preparation for NC Fast. Um, we had to terminate some cases and then reopen them, so that showed up as um, some extra applications. 
but we are trying to get our certification periods all lined up in one case so that when it dumps into NC fast, everybody, you won't have to touch that case but one time hopefully because all the cert periods will line up. If you will turn to page two and look under daycare services, you see we still have 129 children on our waiting list. We have not served anyone from our waiting list since August. Um, we did find out this week that our new budget, which begins in June, is going to be about $54,000 less than last year, which means we're going to have to make some more cuts. Um, last time I told you that we had cut out care for 10 to 12-year-olds. Well, we got some additional money, so we added those children back on. Well, now we're looking at cutting summer care. Um, and our first plan is that we're going to cut summer care for children between the ages of 9 and 12. Um, we may have to cut further. We're hoping we don't. We're sending out letters to those families this week so that they can get a head start on looking for someone to watch their children. We're sending them information about the YMCA and about the scholarship program they have at the Y. Um, but I wanted to let you be aware in case someone said, you know, they're cutting my daycare. That's why, because our budget's getting cut again. Do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. We're certainly uncomfortable with making those cuts, and especially, you know, last, summer before last, we had to take our 10 to, uh, age 10 to 12 um, off during the summer. But with $54,000 cut, I mean, we're really concerned about being able to meet our budget next year, and this may not be deep enough. Um, we'll see after the summer goes by, and we'll kind of see where our spending level is. But um, we certainly are, are concerned and, and hate to do that. How many children is that involved, approximately? It's 35. 35 children. <clears throat> I'm Julie Sebastian. I'm the Adult Services Supervisor. And if you'll look on page three of your statistical report, I just want to mention on our home care community block grant, we just were notified, I think, last week of some cuts that the county is receiving. And um, from April to our fiscal year ending in June 30th, we have taken a cut of our congregate nutrition sites, which we have two sites here in the county, a cut of $1,503. And also our home delivered meals, $500, and all of our other programs, including housing and home improvement and home aid services, a cut of $1,379, which is a large for our small county. And what are we looking at? Probably more adult protective service referrals, more placement. Um, and we're seeing more families are not supportive and helping out their family members. Wanted to bring that to your attention. And also, um, next physical year, we're probably going to hear early May of next physical year's uh, cuts for our home care community block grant programs. And if you'll see, like on page three, um, we still have uh, 113 waiting for in-home aid services, 17 for housing and home improvement, and also 17 for home delivered meals. And we're <coughs> also going to look about waiting lists for our congregate meal sites because we've had some transportation issues. Hopefully we can resolve those in the future. Um, and our cap numbers, we are hoping to get those increased. We do have 94 slots, and if you'll see, we have 72 served. And that's for our disabled and also cap choice clients. Um, it seems like when we put somebody on, somebody passes away or their place, so it's just hard to get those numbers up. And also on page four, our adult protective services reports, we did receive 10, and I just want to mention the middle of April, we've already received 10 this month so there's an increase we did take four referrals yesterday so just wanted to keep that in mind is there any questions okay thank you thank you Good afternoon <clears throat> excuse me i'm kristen eicher and i'm a supervisor with the child welfare unit um the March statistics, if you'll turn to page five on your statistical report. Um, in March, we received 94 reports, and of that 94, 82 were accepted. We screened out 12 reports, and we screened three for other counties. We requested 12 assists to other counties and accepted 11 assists from other counties. Um, there were 63 investigations open on the last day of the month and 32 in-home cases were open on the last day of the month. And we did file two petitions in March. 
I'll be happy to answer any questions. I don't have any. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. I would like to put one of those numbers in perspective for you as we start talking about budget in a few minutes. Um, when you look back at July 68 reports and 36 uh, accepted, and you look at March 94 reports and 82 accepted, the difference between that is um, quite a bit, 46 reports. So we have no more staff in March than we have in July. 46 reports between five workers. Uh, that's 46 additional, not 46 total, 82 total, but 46 additional total reports. And um, if I remember correctly, in years gone by in interaction management, they um, estimated that it takes nine working hours to complete one investigation. Um, so as we talk in a little bit about the budget and about our need for child welfare staff, um, I just wanted to put that in perspective how much the work can fluctuate during the year and during one month even, how um, difficult that is for staff. Hello, I'm Carrie Head, one of the um, supervisors in Child Protective Services. And on page five of your report, I'm gonna um, highlight a couple areas under foster care and adoption services. Um, Notice that in March, eight children entered the custody of the Department of Social Services, which um, equaled 58 children in foster care at, on the last day of March. And um, under adoption, there were two children who uh, exited DSS custody because their final adoption decree was issued. So those children were um, established in their forever home during the month of March. Any questions? Do you still take applications for foster parents or how do you? Yes, we currently have a class um, going on right now and I think there's approximately seven or eight households um, in that class right now and then we will also be having another class in the fall. But any time anybody can contact our agency to get more information and um, learn about how to become a foster parent. Thank you. Thank you. Is that all the supervisors at this time? Uh, now we will have our program for today. It's about Child Abuse Prevention Month. Hi, my name's Heather Hunt. I'm a supervisor in Child Protective Services. Um, I put some prizes in front of your seats today. Um, April is Child Abuse Prevention Month and um, I placed a pinwheel, a plastic pinwheel and a pinwheel um, pin for everyone to have there. Um, the pinwheels, per for, pinwheels for Prevention is the theme for um, Child Abuse Prevention Month, so that's why um, we have the pinwheels. And we like to encourage everybody to plant a pinwheel garden um, at their agency or at their home, whatever they'd like to do. Um, and it just shows support for Child Abuse Prevention Month. And um, Thursday night, um, in, on, in honor of Child Abuse Prevention Month here in the county, um, April 18th at six o'clock, um, there's gonna be a free event for the community at Millersville Baptist Church, and it's called um, Finding Faith. It's a um, actually a movie about a 14-year-old girl who is abducted by an online predator, and um, it features Eric Estrada from Chips. He's gonna be there and people will be able to meet with him afterwards. And it's, um, it's the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force um, is involved with it too. And it just talks about their efforts to have her safely return to her home and um, about safety issues with um, children using the Internet. and. Um, things like that. So we want to encourage everybody to come to that. Um, the doors open at 5 o'clock 
um, that the program starts at six and it is free to the community. Um, anybody who has children in their home or, you know, children, um, they're involved with children, it would be a great thing for them to see. So, yeah. Do we have statistics on how many children in North Carolina are abused annually or? Hmm, I'm not exactly just, sure just, about just that. I have head, no so. idea. <laughs> I know it's a lot. But we'll get you that number, though. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. It's uh, interesting. I'm sure it's an in interesting statistics. We'll, we'll be glad to yeah. share it with you. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. At, at this time, we'll, we will now hear items from the BSS director, Cinda Holman. Okay. I am so happy to report, everybody knock, knock on wood all at one time, <laughs> that we have no current vacancies. Um, we actually are holding a vacancy at this time. Uh, we have an intern who is working with us and he, who is doing a very good job for us that we really like. And the, um, the great thing about having interns is you get to raise them like you like them. <laughs> so... Um, he, they do work for free during that time. That's a good point, Chef. Um, so he's doing a really good job for us, and um, if he continues to do so, um, we would like to uh, bring him on board, and he will graduate first week in May. May 11th. May 11th. So um, that is the only uh, vacancy we have at this very moment, and I hope that it will stay that way for a little while. Um, I wanted to tell you, I, I'm going to switch items, switch these last two items, and we'll talk about the budget last, if that's okay. Um, I went to a meeting last week um, in New Bern, North Carolina, and it was the annual Directors Association meeting, and um, we did, uh, had a plethora of, of uh, presentations there, but um, one of the things that we learned was that Sherry Bradshaw, who was formerly our um, division, so, division of Social Services Director, is now the Deputy Secretary for DHHS, which is a absolutely wonderful thing for us in these times, um, in this economy and with so many things on the plate of social services in the future. It's wonderful that she has been promoted. Um, she got a, a promotion back in February, I think it was um, Deputy, something about long-term care. Um, but she has moved up to the Deputy Secretary for DHHS, so that's great news. Um, we did hear while we were there, there was a lot of talk about um, Medicaid transportation, which you're going to hear about in a minute um, in the budget presentation, and um, we did hear that we will hear something soon about the um, RFPs that went out for a broker for uh, North Carolina. Um, do not know anything yet. Um, we also um, heard some presentations about um, small groups that are going to be convened to take a look at child welfare um, conceptually to move practice toward best practices and what's working best in some communities and what things are, um, are cost effective. Um, and what we were kind of told was, as opposed to scream, screaming about the 4E funding that we have lost, which um, um, what happened was in 2011, we had a, um, a federal audit. It was, it was actually um, a review of our administra administrative practices in the area of using 4E federal funds. And through that review of the state, um, it was determining that, determined that we were, um, had misinterpreted in North Carolina the definition of the use of federal 4E funds for in-home services in child welfare. And what that means, <laughs> that's a lot of jargon, but what that means is when we substantiate or fund in need uh, and provide mandatory services to a family if we've gone out there on a report of abuse or neglect and then we've found that report basically to be true and that family to be in need of mandatory services, we send it to a service called in-home services. So that's child welfare in-home. Um, 
we found that we had been misinterpreting the definition of pulling down that funding source for that particular service. And what it basically meant to us was that we lost 50% of our funding for that service. Um, as you can imagine, that was handed right down to the counties. So, and uh, in our budget this year, we lost, I think our last total was, we last looked at it, it was $99,000 that we lost. And that had to come right off the top um, as we began our budget preparatory process. Um, so they are, in essence, what was said to us at that director's meeting was that we, okay, we hear you, you've lost funding. Um, there's nowhere for the state to come up with that funding at this point either, and so we need to start thinking about how can we do our business a little differently. Um, so they have established a work group, and, and I, that's good. <laughs> they need to look at it. Um, we did hear some, um, and I have not shared this with Trina, we, we did hear that there was some possibility that SEEK, which is a, a new um, automated system, you'll hear NC FAST, um, is an automated system also, but SEEK was an automated system specifically just for childcare. And what we heard at that meeting is that that uh, effort may get um, put on the back burner because NC Fast is moving so quickly and because child welfare, the NC Fast part for child welfare has been stalled because of um, there, there was a hope that we could get 90-10, which means 90% federally funded and 10% state funding to um, help NC FAST pick up child welfare and to automate that program. We're, heard, we're hearing now that that funding may not be available and that child welfare is going on the back burner. And what that means is that child care will get pushed up to the front. So there would be no reason to push SEEK forward if NC FAST is going to pick up childcare. Um, so that is, that is what we're hearing at the state level. There was lots and lots and lots of talk at that meeting about NC FAST and I have brought back notes galore and shared them with the, the supervisors about that. Um, they did mention a little ditty that I hadn't heard before and it was that no fee cost for storage initially for NC FAST. And what that means is the data storage in that automated system, there's going to be no cost. But I noticed that they kept saying that word initially, which could mean that at some point we would pick up some, the counties may pick up some cost for storage. Um, I don't know a whole lot about that, but I mentioned that to you just to say, okay, next year at budget time, if I'm talking about storage, um, you'll know that I brought that forward. Um, the EPASS system, phase three, will go live on April the 21st, which means that folks that are have access to the internet at their home or at the library or wherever they can get at access to the internet will be able to make application from that place. And that work will go into what we're calling a queue, where the work will sit until Matthew or Trina <laughs> pulls that work up and we will work those cases and so it will uh, be important for us to be constantly monitoring that. Um, they did say that other states that have electronic applications, that the vast majority of their applications come in electronically. I had heard that, I had heard that was true and then we had heard that was not true, but they had, they gave some states, I did not write them down, that they gave, and it was six or eight states that all, most of their um, applications are coming in electronically, and then there were two or three where they're, where they're not. So it appears that the vast majority of states where they have electronic processing, that they're getting them. And all that means is people are putting their applications in through the internet versus coming into the office and sitting down with somebody and applying. And then they did uh, encourage us to do everything we could to teach our clients how to use the internet because it is more efficient use of their time and our time. So um, those were just some highlights from the meeting. There was um, obviously a lot more in two and a half days, but uh, those are things that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, the last thing, unless you have any questions about any of that, 
the last thing um, I did want to do was have us have you um, take one more look at, at your budget. Um, if you'll look, a, a budget packet has been put in to your packet. And um, we did have a brief, uh, a fairly brief work session um, back a couple weeks ago and um, reviewed um, what had, what, where we were at that point. We have tweaked it a little bit. Um, we've changed a few numbers, and I guess the biggest thing I can say about that is if you look at the very last page that you have in front of you, at the bottom of that page, you will see that the to total county dollar um, increase has um, gone down a little bit from the time we first presented it to you. So um, that's a good thing. Um, I, Sherry would could launch into or, or, uh, a long story about um, child support monies if we if we want to talk about where the difference was, but um, I I think that um, the good news is is that's a significant difference than what we um, first talked with you about. Um, I can go through I can go through item by item and talk with you uh, about some things um, that we've proposed, but I, I would like to just maybe. Um, go through one more time the big things that made a difference in, in this budget. Um, you heard me just a minute ago talk about um, the 4E reduction. That was $99,000. Um, we did have a reduction in our social services block grant funding, um, 33.5. That was a significant reduction. Um, you heard, just heard Trina talk about a $54,000 reduction in child care monies for next year. Um, we did have a reduction in child support incentives, and um, that funding comes to us. Um, the incentive money, we had a, another audit <laughs> that cost us. <laughs> um, a, a couple of years ago, we had a review from the feds of um, child support data integrity. Uh, reliability and um, there were some errors not from Alexander County they did pull a random sample of cases and we did have a case pulled however we did not have an error on our case but there were some error cases and the North Carolina um, took a reduction in the incentive monies made available to them due to that audit now last year North Carolina passed their um, data uh, reliability audit and um, we do hope that incentive monies will come back up but we used our state budget in our <coughs> estimates to put to decide and it was a twenty four thousand six hundred thirty six dollar reduction uh, from the year before um, <clears throat> there is still um, some concern about court filing fees but we do think that the directors association and our county commissioners I will tell you um, when we saw some legislation that uh, promoted uh, additional child support fees for um, show cause motions and different motions that we bring into court on child support, we saw that and we knew it was going to cost us big time, 20 bucks a pop just about. Um, I did send that forward to our county manager. He sent it to our commissioners, and I will tell you there was a flurry of emails to our legislators about that, and we do feel like that um, that may have been um, slowed, if not resolved. So we'll see how that plays out in the coming year. Um, we have more children in foster care, more children in high-dollar placements, um, and that increase was it was quite significant. Um, let me look at my letter here. Um, $290,340 is what is additionally in our budget for this coming year than last year. Um, and what I would say to you is that um, you, you heard or you saw in our statistical report today, we took eight children into custody last month. Um, one placement um, where a child cannot, can't make it in foster home, maybe can't make it even in a therapeutic foster home, 
um, when we go to make that placement, one placement for one child for a year can cost us as much as $54,192. That is to meet that child's needs. Um, so with more children in these high dollar placements, we basically, what we did was took the number of children that we have in custody right now or when we were preparing the budget, we took those children, <coughs> we looked at where they had to be placed and we anticipated that going forward for a year. Now, will we have those exact same children in custody for a whole year? Probably not. We'll take us some new ones in. Some will go home. Some will go to permanent placements, those kinds of things. But we felt like that we would be, um, would not be doing what we needed to do unless we anticipated at least where we are right now. Plus, we added one high-dollar child. <laughs> and that is the way that we forecast our budget for foster care for next year. Um, it was an increase, like I told you, of $290,000. So that's a significant increase. Um, if you look at the salary, um, or, or you, you were able to, you can look on in your budget uh, packet at the salary line, but I will tell you the things that made a, a significant difference, and that was we did have to budget for the next year for the increase that was given to employees, to county employees who made less than $50,000 last year or this year, in the current year, we have to budget that for next year. And that's $65,000 uh, immediately added to our salary line. Um, we did budget a transportation scheduler and four part-time drivers, all of those positions part-time, uh, with no benefits. That's the most cost-effective way we could think of doing that service. But you heard Julie stand up here a minute ago and say we have congregate folks that need to get to the congregate meal sites um, to be fed, that we cannot get them there. Um, and so we have, um, and we've had other transportation issues, including some Medicaid transportation issues. Our number of clients in our Medicaid that are being managed right now by our Medicaid transportation coordinator has jumped, it seemed like to me in two or three weeks, it jumped from 300 people to 500 people who are receiving vouchers to get to their Medicaid appointments. So we have Greenway as our first line of defense for Medicaid transportation, then we have our voucher <coughs> system, and this would present yet another way to get people that's a mandated service. Medicaid transportation is mandated. If you're going to give them Medicaid, they have to be able to get to the doctor. Um, <coughs> and then we put um, a part-time, we put part-time workers in here, um, NC Fast. We have, for the last couple of years, have um, used part-time workers to fill in gaps where we have had illness, where we've had um, <coughs> vacancy, where we've had work that, that we couldn't get done without some more help. Um, and we have used lapsed salary to fill, and that's a, that's a, a pretty risky business to use lapsed salary because you're anticipating at that point that you're going to have vacancies, which I hope we don't. <laughs> I think everybody in this management team hopes that we don't have vacancies in the coming year. So we decided that this year we just cannot take that risk. We know that we're going to have to have some help with this new automated system. We have two part-time workers on board right now. So we did um, budget two <coughs> additional part-time workers. Um, we budgeted an additional income maintenance caseworker. And you heard us say a minute ago, we had to pull one of our, was Christy doing, what was, what was her job? Was it Medicaid before? <coughs> Christy was doing, um, Christy Markham, who's our Medicaid transportation coordinator, was doing uh, Medicaid, Family and Children's Medicaid, um, year before last. And last March, April, I think, we pulled her out of that job. Now, mind you, we didn't lose any of her caseload, and she had a full caseload. But we had to have somebody to do Medicaid transportation. We were mandated to do this service. They added a whole lot of responsibilities. So we pulled her out of the job she was doing and took that full caseload and divided it out amongst other workers. Um, at this time, 
we just can no longer spread that. We can't spread those staff any thinner, and we're going to have to have a worker to replace um, that position. Additionally, just besides the work that exists, you know that we're headed into welfare reform. We're headed into Medicaid changes, and we can um, not not be prepared, at least minimally, for those changes. So we need that income ca maintenance caseworker. Um, we budgeted two child welfare positions. Um, you heard us just talking about um, the foster care population, how it has jumped up, and um, we need those positions. Um, we would like to. Um, we had presented this in a golden leaf proposal, and we did not get funded for that. But we would like to take two workers um, and put them at the, in the school system. They would not be school system employees. They would not get to work from 8 to 3.30. <laughs> they would be full-time DSS <coughs> workers, but we would actually externally locate them at the school system. Um, we would take cases that are existing and move into those caseloads, for instance, at the high school, we would take all the foster children that are at the high school and move them into the caseload of that person who would be located at the school. But our hope is, is that if we could get into the schools, we don't do preventative, a lot of preventative work right now. And the reason being is that we can barely do what we're mandated to do. But we feel like if we were co-located and we were working collaboratively with the schools, that we might be able to identify some of those high-risk kids and instead of bringing them into our foster care caseloads, we work those cases real hard at, at a level that might be kind of smell like prevention um, and keep our caseloads from just growing and growing and growing. Um, we do need those positions. Um, the other thing I would mention to you about that is our foster care <coughs> caseloads right now are over the state standard. <coughs> 15 children in a caseload is the state standard. If we go to 16, we have some fluctuation. A child comes in, a child goes home. But when we get to 20 um, in a caseload, we have really stepped out on a limb because, um, I will tell you this because I'm a former state children's program rep, and what they said to us to say to counties all the time when I was in that position was, if a county is doing what the state, we're a, we're a state supervised county administered system in North Carolina. So when the state who supervises us <coughs> says to us, there shall be, not maybe, there shall be no more than 15 children in one foster care caseload. If we go to 20 and we have, um, you know, heaven forbid, a fatality, then if we're within standards at 15, we've got the whole Division of Social Services and the Attorney General's office behind us. If we go above those standards and step <coughs> way out there and have those real high caseloads and we're not doing what the state has asked us to do, then we're Alexander County stepping out on that limb. So it's really <coughs> important for us, and, and we'll make that, uh, that you know, same point with our commissioners, and certainly Daryl's heard this spiel before. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted you to understand why, in an economic environment that is so tough, why we're asking for staff. It's not because uh, we're not asking for, a, you know, a, a hot tub in the lobby. We're, we're asking for the things that we need to meet the needs of the people in our community and the children in our custody. So I wanted that those are those are the biggies in the salary line. Um, we could go through a lot of these lines, but I, each of you have a budget packet, and I, I do want to know if you have questions or if um, if there's anything you feel like you need to know about the budget. Uh, and Dr. Mosley, that's a that's a tough question for you today. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot to digest. Uh, um, so, Cindy, you were saying earlier that we're full staff. That is with your employees you have now, but we're going to have to have additional ones. That's is correct. That, that is correct. correct. In, in order to meet the needs in the community, we're, we're going to have to have. We have proposed 
three additional full-time staff, two child welfare workers, and one income maintenance position. We have uh, proposed the part-time schedule and the four part-time drivers, and that's two morning drivers and two afternoon drivers. They'll have to work together to coordinate a, a schedule, and we'll have to have someone to tell them where to go to. Um, so that's the part-time schedule, and then the part two part-time positions to help us with the MC Fast Coefficient. Those are the positions that we have put into the to the budget, and that all of that is in here. Um. I agree with you. There's not a lot of fluff in the budget, and it's it's always the same thing. It's tag. You're it. The state and the federal government think that the, they can cut and bounce their budget on the backs of the county, and I know it's tough for our, for our commissioners to make the decisions they have to make to. Uh, to meet the needs of our county, but we also have to realize that we don't have a choice when a child shows up on our doorsteps. We have to take care of them no matter what the cost. And I think anybody in this county would feel that way too. And uh, I, as one, will like to make a motion that we present this budget to the commissioners. Do I get a second? I'll second. It's been moved and second that we do present this budget to the commissioners at your next meeting. <coughs> All in favor of say aye. Aye. Is there anyone opposed? This? If not, <coughs> thank you so much. And we may be calling on you. <laughs> I, I imagine this is not the last conversation we'll have about this. <laughs> now, are we going into a closed session today? We are. Okay. <coughs> Are there any items from the board at this time? If not, the next meeting of the Alexander County Board of Social Services will be held May the 21st at 4 o'clock, and it'll be here at CVCC. And do I get a motion to enter into closed se session under General Statute 143-318.11? So I make a motion that we go into closed session. Do I get a second? Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that um, you all can be dismissed. We're going into closed session. <laughs> <laughs>